Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season four, episode 14, titled Baseballs of Death. I'm disappointed. There was no <laughs> baseballs in this. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on February 19th, 1988. It is written by Peter Lance, who also wrote Rising Death. He likes death. 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 Mm. <laughs> of death. <laughs> He's still got two more episodes coming. Now, this guy's actually pretty interesting because he is the original producer for 2020. Back wow. in 1978, 1978 to 1982 is when he was the show's producer he also wrote the story damn oh, okay so he's got another tie-in the director is bill duke well let's go talk about this one because we're gonna flip the miami vice world upside down <laughs> just like we love nookie let's go talk about this one <laughs> all right john we literally had one song last week we and then a week before that we had theme songs they gotta do better this week right they do in a sense we got four different songs by four different people no so we, way. we're already starting off better <laughs> let's start with the first song in the episode pump up the volume by mars or m slash a slash r slash r slash s i don't know how you pronounce that with that many slashes in it honestly <laughs> there is so many subdirectories uh it's so fine just gotta grep out what i'm looking for to see where it is uh nerd jokes someone out there will get it Tweet at me. Tweet at me at Dom Corbo. Let me know if you go. <laughs> Mars is a collaboration between the groups AR Kane and Colorbox. They only released one double sided single. The name is an acronym of the first letters of each of the members' names. AR Kane and Colorbox both signed. To the same label, 4AD. The owner of 4AD, the founder of 4AD, was Ivo Watt Russell. He actually is the one that suggested that they team up together after both bands pitched an idea to do a dance, a more dance album. So, but things didn't go so well once they got to production. Uh, uh, in fact, the bands uh, didn't get along so much that they ended up splitting them up, giving them each one song to work on individually, and then they would trade songs, and then basically the other person's song and add to it. And the results were you had color box came up with Pump Up the Volume. That AR came, added, basically added some guitar to, and then DJ Chris CJ McIntosh added some scratches and a ton of samplings, like 40 samplings. Uh, is this the Beastie Boys? And AR... <laughs> and AR Kane came up with the song Anatina, in which Fox proceeded to put a bunch of heavy ass drums to. Color Box didn't want to release with Anatina. They actually wanted to release Pump Up the Volume under their name, Color Box, uh, on its own single. They didn't want to have anything to do with AR Kane. Russell, founder of the label, overruled them and put the two back to back A side, B side. And it actually destroyed the relationship with the band Color Box. They actually never worked uh, with 4AD again. Mm. So, song actually, so huge surprise, the song Anatina didn't do very well. They kind of bombed. <laughs> but, pump up the volume, shot up the charts. It was actually, it was number one in UK, Canada, New Zealand, US. It was really big. And actually, it was number one in the US after they re released it. Because they had some legal issues over some of the many samplings released in the song. And it's actually kind of silly. I looked at all the different things. They, they sampled James Brown and all of these different artists and everything. And what they actually got sued over was seven seconds of an anonymous voice moaning the word, hey. <laughs> It was originally from something called Roadblock, and they agreed to remove it in the re-released version. But many believe that it was just a ploy to basically sandbag the song because the person who was behind the lawsuit was also involved with Greg Isley's Never Gonna Give You Up, which was also topping the charts at that same time. You know, it sounds an awful lot like my YouTube channel, too. I got so many takedown notices. Get off my back, MCA. <laughs> So, as you could probably 
Imagine the two groups never collaborated again. There was never anything else ever made by Mars. <laughs> <laughs> the song is 20 Killer Hurts. 20 Killer Hurts by Gene Loves Jezebel. Gene Loves Jezebel British rock group formed in the early 80s by identical brothers Jay and Michael Aston. The name of the band actually refers to the musician Gene Vincent and his song Jezebel. Oh, okay. There were many, many, many different members of this band. The original incarnation of the band saw Ian Hudson on guitar, even Davis on bass, with a drummer named Snowy White. <laughs> I so wanted to learn more about Snowy White, the drummer, but he, alas, he does not have his own Wikipedia. <laughs> Snowy White, if you're out there, contact us. John will write your Wikipedia page and maintain it for you. I will. I promise. <laughs> From 81 to 85, they just, there was just a ton of lineup changes. <clears throat> they released three albums and they'd seen some success. And then their fourth album came out with a little bit more of a dance album and featured a song called Motion of Love, which graced the U.S. charts, but, was, but ended up being their biggest U.K. hit, reaching the n number 56 on the uh, U.K. charts. So from 90 to 97, Michael Aston, he would leave the band briefly to, to, to do some solo projects. The rest of the band with Jay Aston would continue. They'd release two albums along with a hit their hit jealous which would become their biggest u.s hit reaching number 68 on the hot 100 and number one on modern rock but their album heavenly bodies though doing very well in portugal incredibly well in portugal <laughs> would do very well because their u.s label savage records would collapse financially and so it wouldn't really be released uh, or distributed in the U.S. much. Their lack of record of a record label in the U.S. forced the band into somewhat of a hiatus. In 93, after the hiatus, Mike and Jay reformed Gene Loves Jezebel. They weren't totally serious with it because they reformed the band, but Jay would still perform acoustic solo shows. Mike would do side projects with members of the band Scenic, and he would form a band called Immigrants, which would eventually be renamed Edith Grove. But they pretty much spent most of the mid-90s sporadically working together until 97, when Jay and Mike had a falling out during a reunion tour. It was so bad that Mike actually left the tour and Jay would have to finish solo. <laughs> this, this, is where things get, this is where things get a little funny. So Mike decides... All right, guys, screw you, I'm going home. And then he starts his own version, Gene Loves Jezebel. So now there's two Gene Loves Gene <laughs> loves Jezebel. There's Mike's version and Jay's version, which has the original band member. So, or maybe a, an original band member and whatever other band members they had hired at, at the time. It, it gets, it's confusing. <laughs> so for a while, they perform as two different bands uh, eventually jay and the uh, and the rest of his band would sue for use their name for copyright infringement and after a prolonged court case jay would uh, and the band would drop the suit essentially coming to the agreement mike's version would be the u.s version and jay's version would be the uk version even though they would both tour in the U.S. and U.K., vice versa, you know. <laughs> After all that, it came up once again in 2008 when, this time, Mike sued Jay and eventually was settled by them determining that in the U.S., Mike's band would be known as In Loves Jezebel, but Jay's band would be Jay's ver Jay's UK G version of Gene Loves Jezebel. <laughs> Whereas in the UK, Jay's... No, I'm not making this up. Jay's band would be known as Gene Loves Jezebel, <laughs> whereas Mike's would be known as Mike's U.S. version of Gene Loves Jezebel. <laughs> Just to make things completely clear. I'm pretty sure they're still making music. Let's move on to Breakaway by Big Pig. <laughs> this name. Big Pig is an Australian <laughs> funk rock band from uh, that... <laughs> Big Pig. Big Pig. Uh, they, they're, <laughs> they were formed in 85 <laughs> and lasted until 91. This is a weird band, dude. Big Pig was inspired 
by Japanese haiku drummers. And so the band was formed to have eight or nine drummers drumming all orchestrated together. So literally the band was made up of a vocalist uh, and drummer, drummer, a, a, a vocalist and harmonica player, a keyboardist, a few more drummers, and a couple more drummers. No guitars. <laughs> bass, no guitars. Drums, harmonica, keyboards, that's it. <laughs> Their first record would see success on the in the uh, Aus- in Australia and New Zealand on the dance scene. And they would adopt a uh, signature look wearing black waterproof aprons similar to like a Bournemouth style. Their album hit the U.S. Their first album would also chart up to number 60 on the Hot 100. They would soon after tour the U.S. Their popularity was really going strong. Their song Money God was the theme for BBC's Def 2's Rough Guide show. This song Breakaway was also used at the beginning of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Mm. And then their second album came out and it kind of got lukewarm reception. They toured a little bit more and then just abruptly disbanded in April 1991. After they broke up in 91, I mean, you know, uh, only releasing two albums. In the aftermath, one guy went solo. Another one played in some other bands. Another guy joined an 80s nostalgia group, but nothing big. No one no one really made it famous or anything. So our last <laughs> song is Running on the Rocks by Shriekback. Shriekback, by the way, also appeared in the episode of Knock Knock Who's There. So we've already met Shriekback before. They're an English thought, rock band. Yeah, I thought they sounded familiar, but I couldn't put my finger on it. <laughs> Yeah, they're an English rock band, and they were formed from the members of former band XTC and Gang of Four. Essentially, they formed a one. They released five albums with some success. One of the founding members would go back to uh, the band Gang of Four after that. They would split up in 88, and then they would reform in 92, release two more albums. So, so results. Then they weren't released anything until 2003. And then since 2003, they're just still making music. But I mean, they're not like, they're not blowing up the charts or anything. They got consistent radio play, I'm assuming. But I mean, just no real, nothing really big as far as hits, even though they released 14 studio albums. <laughs> <laughs> no hits in 14 but, studio albums. <laughs> But Michael Mann apparently is a big fan, seeing as he's used several songs in his projects Manhunter and Band of Hand, as well as being used a few times in Vice. There you have it. Our music. Just random bunch of pretty much (laughs) one-hit wonders and half-famous nobodies. As a fan of metal music, when someone says there's not enough guitars on stage, I tend to agree. There can always be more guitars, but Gene loves Jezebel. Or is it? No, it's Big Pig. Big Pig likes to say, "I got you. Big Pig. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get you so many drummers that <laughs> there can never be enough drummers. We're just gonna keep adding them." <laughs> I mean, I kind of want listen to more Big Pig now because I kind of want to see how they coordinate nine drummers on the same stage. <laughs> I guess it's got to be chaos. I'm also disappointed in Miami Vice fans in the '80s. They should have made Shriek back a bigger thing. Like, you all should have banded <laughs> together, made sure that you supported Michael Mann. Like, he put him in everything. Yeah, come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. We've been holding it a secret. Time for the secret to be revealed. Let's go give our final thoughts. Let us know what you think. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at go with the heat, Instagram at go with the heat, Facebook.com slash go with the heat. You can find all of those ways. You can contact us and let us know what your real thoughts are. I want to hear it. Email me. Let me know. I want to hear what your thoughts are on Baseballs to Death because your Go With The Heat podcast is saying it's a good episode of Miami Vice. I want to hear from you. Email us. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website. Go with the heat.com. You can find any of the other ways to contact us, all the other podcatcher platforms out there. And you know what? Go to that podcaster platform of choice give us the highest ranking that you can because you know that helps people find the show and helps us out shows that you support us but talk about how what your feelings are on the exact episode of baseball's death because no one reads the reviews that people leave on podcasts go on there and talk about what your stance is on baseball's of death i want to hear from you 
Check out that website, emailsgoldthing at gmail.com. Give us a review on your podcast and platform of choice. And be sure to check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.